Hi, I'm Seamless, and today is Saturday, which means it's time for a new FL Basics tutorial. This one begins a series of tutorial tutorials where I'm going to go over the various synth plugins that are available inside FL Studio. And I'm going to start with the one that I feel like people should really try to familiarize themselves with first, and this is Image Lines Citrus. Now, this isn't the most basic one. Arguably, the more basic and simple one would be the 3X oscillator, and we will talk about that. However, I don't... There are parts about the 3X oscillator that I don't think are as intuitive as how Citrus works. And while Citrus is an FM plugin, and the whole FM process can be kind of complicated to get into, you don't actually need to worry about the FM to use Citrus uh, and, and to do pretty much anything that a uh, 3X oscillator can do. In fact, for years, I mostly looked at Citrus as kind of being a 6X oscillator. But let's get into what it does. So, like I said, Citrus is, is, is a, an FM plugin that stands for Frequency Modulation, which is a whole thing which I'm not going to talk about today. This is mostly going to be just a very basic sort of UI familiarization of using Citrus and, or, and routing stuff. And we'll worry about all the science about F, of FM later. If you are super curious about FM, I actually have a whole playlist about it in my channel. And you can check that out and it will inform you on lots of stuff. So, uh, to start... I have, I have the default default preset where it loads up operator one, well, it loads up all the operators as a, as a sine wave and it outputs operator one over here. Before we even talk about the operators, let's talk about the matrix because the majority of what you're gonna be doing is gonna end up, end up kind of in there. Uh, beyond basic FM functionality where you FM one operator by another operator through routing it into, into these knobs, you also route things like the internal FX, filters, and just straight output uh, through this panel as well. So for example, if I made operator two uh, saw wave, if I played it, nothing happens because operator one is currently routed out. And if I wanted operator two, then I could route it out too. Now, you might have noticed that I can actually route it on one end or the other, and it doesn't actually mean that it turns off all the way. What that means is actually just phase, because these knobs, all of these knobs, are not 0 to 100, they are negative 100 to 100, which is to say that the center is actually full on off, which is why you see them all in the off position when they're all in the center. If you go in one direction or the other, that turns it on, and you could have, the negative 100 is basically saying that it's out of phase. Which is why it sounds like there's no bass when I do something like this, that's because the sine wave, and the frequency that is that sine wave, and the saw wave are phasing against each other and that's causing phase cancellation, which is a concept that I covered in the production basics playlist, if you want to check that out as well. Um, anyway, so that functionality alone is enough for what I just said to say that you, re you can really think of this as being a sort of a 6x oscillator because there are six operators and then you have outputs and you can just have all them out and you can have different shapes, you can layer them and that's really kind of neat. Now, I noticed that I refer to these as operators, even though I said you could think of this as a 6x oscillator. What's the difference between an operator and an oscillator? The difference between an operator is that an operator has a whole bunch of sort of built-in functionality beyond just, you know, what the waveform is. So the first uh, operator, you know, being a sine wave, it's a sine wave and you can change, you know, the waveform and that's very neat. And by the way, this is how you do that with this fader. And this is one of the neater things about FL is that it doesn't really rely on choosing a particular waveform. You can morph between a waveform. You can even do a lot more than just waveform shape. And you can create particularly interesting waveforms. That do neat stuff. You can also right click the waveform itself to, to jump straight to, the, to the, the one of the four basic wave types that you want. The square type, if you go, if you just keep going, it actually does pulse width modulation. If you wanted to get more chip tuning. Um, there's also these modifiers up here, which uh, are about all about um, changing the shape of the waveform, which it does, it impacts how the waveform sounds, but that's really more of a utility for FM related stuff. And you can do mess with that and if you like it, then it's neat, but for the most part, its purpose in life is to solve particular issues in the FM world, which we'll talk about eventually. Not in this video, by the way. Now, the rest of the stuff you have, things like pitch, um, fa phase, and 
like the vo the volume built in as well. All these different parameters <clears throat> are different kinds of controls that, when grouped together, form the idea of an operator. It's also called an operator. Like this, this is what it was. This is the configuration that was referred to on the Yamaha DX7, which was the first digital FM synthesizer. Which is a, the the history of it and the importance of it are all a huge thing. But um, it's worth pointing out that any FM plugin. Uh, any digital FM plugin all works in the same way that the Yamaha DX7 does. In fact, if you have Yamaha DX DX7 um, SysX files, you can import them into Citrus and things like FM8 and that kind of thing, and it'll actually configure it to be the patch that that SysX files was, which is kind of interesting. Anyway, there are other uh, the way the way the pitch works is actually kind of important. So we have two pitch modes: we have a ratio, and we have hertz. So the ratio point is the idea that it's the ratio is relative to particular values and relative to each of the other operators. By default, it's set to two. Some some plugins like Harmer, for example, are set to one, which is just an octave lower. And that's how ratios work: is that if you want to go an octave higher, you go double the ratio. And if you want to go an octave lower, you do half the ratio. And you may try to get specific note values out of. Um, the ratio and how that works, but I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, there's another method of doing that. We'll talk about that in a second. And then the other part is this hertz value. Now, if I have the ratio set to zero, it's just not going to make any sound. And if I set a hertz value, every note is now that pitch. Because the ratio is also con is, it's the idea that the ratio is controlled by, you know, relative to the keys and that kind of thing. The, whole, the reason why ratios even you even need ratios are for uh, various FM type things because if you the difference between like hertz changes and note changes are not the same because like uh, a distance of an octave is twice the hertz value so if I have a note let's say a four forty an octave higher is a eight eighty an octave lower is a two twenty the difference between two twenty and four forty is two hundred twenty hertz but the difference between four forty and eight eighty is four hundred forty hertz. So that's twice the hertz range. So that's why there's a difference. That's, that's why I have this ratio collection so that if I make a, in a really high-pitched oscillator and a really low-pitched oscillator, that when I play the note and they all move together and they are the correct ratio apart, the correct um, orientation of pitch so that the tone is relative to the note that you're playing. And then the hertz value is there if you want to eschew that and do different changes based on you know just the speed of that uh, value which is cool. So the waveform modifiers are pretty much self-explanatory. They just kind of, um, you can just see what they do when you're messing around with it. But to give a specific example, uh, this tension modifier is a little bit like what distortion does to a sound, which is neat. The skew just skews it. And then there's a sign shaper where it introduces sort of a sine, sine wavy aspect to it, which I mean, I don't mean like, you know, that kind of thing. It's a little bit hard to explain on, like with words beyond to say what it does. And then there's the pre-filter where it will shave off some harmonics. Like if I have a really sharp saw wave, for example, if I put the pre-filter on, you can see that it kind of gets a little bit softer. And there's actually some fun truths about that that we'll talk about in a second. And then this is the noise level, which is just a noise. You just introduce noise to the oscillator. You can also fade in to have noise and the oscillator, or you can just have only noise in case you just want a noise oscillator. These various uh, settings are, uh, center is for when you have something that's referred to as DC offset, where um, even if you're not playing a note, there's going to be an output because you're setting the waveform to be um, having a value, even if it's not on. And then you hit that, and then it keeps it, Centered um, for when it's off off center. You'll know when that becomes a problem when it becomes a problem. Declicking is for when uh, it snaps on. This is usually for when you change the phase because by default the the correct phase is what we're seeing now, which is that it starts on zero and then goes back to zero. But if it starts on non-zero, then it's not going to be a smooth transition and it won't sound and it'll, a sound that doesn't necessarily have a click will have a click. Then declicking de will get rid of that. Band limiting is to do with the concept of the Nyquist frequency sample rate and what what happens when uh, sounds go higher than that and alias. 
Uh, I think I may have done a tutorial about that, but long story short is that um, at any given sample rate, you have a limit of the highest frequency that you can generate, which is half the sample rate. This particular frequency is referred to as the Nyquist frequency. So for 44.1 kilohertz, that, that frequency is 22.05 kilohertz. And um, if you try to make a tone higher than that, instead of it, you know, just not happening because it just can't do it, what it, it still tries to make the sound, but instead of going higher, it goes lower. It goes lower by the amount that you try to go higher above Nyquist. And if you do that hard enough, you'll eventually come back down to a range where you'll hear it really audibly and it'll sound kind of weird. And really what that sounds like is just kind of horrible distortion. Kind of like that. So you can actually see it in the spectrum analyzer up here. If you, if you see what happens, it's very noisy and weird. And then I turn on band limit, and now it's clean. That's what band limiting does. It puts an extremely sharp uh, filter up at where Nyquist is, and it prevents anything from even trying to get higher than that. And that makes it uh, much cleaner. This is very important for for something a very like a very high harmonic waveform like a saw wave, where if you push it higher, you're pushing a lot of harmonics higher than Nyquist. That's the value of that. Um, and there's the plucked mode, which is a really a special thing. It's just kind of weird. You notice that it turns off all FM because it no longer it no longer actually FMs anything. You can see what it's doing in the, in the spectrum analyzer, where it's basically just putting a, a rolling filter on it to sort of make it sound like a plucky thing. Uh, that's basically what's, what's up. And we have the phase knob, and we have this global knob, which uh, changes between re-triggered or global phase, where it'll stay the same phase forever, or it'll set, reset the phase every time. That is something that'll become important when we get to more FME based stuff. We have the volume, which is um, plus 100 and minus 100, and then the pitch envelope amount, which changes the range of pitch changes in this lower area down here. So let's talk about the lower area. Now, so the way that SIP just works is that every operator has a set of parameters, and that's on this top row of tabs. And then each parameter, each tab, has a set of per, uh, modifiers. So, for example, on the volume tab, I have an envelope, I have an LFO, key mapping, velocity mapping, mod X and Y, which on the top, on the front page, is these guys over here. And then, um, you know, randomization and unison index mapping, which is a fun deal. Now, earlier I mentioned that if you want to do like a specific note value change in the pitch level, that you, I would not recommend doing it with the ratio settings. You can do it with the ratio settings. And in fact, there's, pro there's, a, there's a, a website somewhere that mapped out specific ratio uh, numbers for getting that value. <clears throat> it's really very specific and you can do that. However, uh, if I just go to the envelope side of the pitch, engage step edit mode, right click and remove all the points, and then... Um, turn snap on, the the pitch change graph is actually represented in the semitones per octave. So there's one octave up and one octave down. By default, center value is the right pitch. So if I wanted to change it to, say, a fifth, actually, let's do a third because a fifth is actually pretty easy in the ratio. So you can do that. It's a lot easier than trying to figure out the ratio business. So uh, everything else, uh, the really mostly is pretty self-explanatory. The rate, uh, the the um, envelope business and the ADSR stuff is actually a little bit interesting. Uh, so <clears throat> there is on on here when you turn on when you enable the uh, particular parameter modifier. Uh, you, especially for envelopes, you get these attack and decay things, and whatever. These, however, are mostly just offsets for what you already are seeing in here. The thing is, though, is that you don't need this. You saw me delete it, and you can actually, and the, the way that the graph is built is sort of deceptively simple because it looks like this is just what it is. However, you can just get rid of it and make it your own. Do weird stuff and, you know, kind of cause havoc. <laughs> The thing is, though, is that you do need to have, like, if you right-click the point, you can actually tell it to be what point in the ADSR that it actually is. So we have things like, you have decay and then sustain, 
loop end. And so what this will mean is that anything before decay is listed as being the attack. Anything after sustain is listed as being release. That's kind of what there is to that. So if I said if I actually went back in here and right-click this and said loop start, now it'll loop between the decay and the end of the sustain. And then of course you can mess around with it with the modifiers that are present there. So that you can do a lot of with the line editors inside inside editors. LFO is pretty straightforward, although it doesn't look like it's doing a good job right now. The whole reason why this setup is here is to imply that you can change a lot about LFOs <clears throat> that you might not have thought of before. And uh, if you get rid of it all, then it just turns itself into a regular, normal LFO window. Just let you know, you can automate these parameters. Yeah. Now, key mapping is pretty, uh, basically it's setting value per what, what note it is. So if I did this, the lower notes will be quieter, the higher notes will be louder. Velocity mapping is saying that it's like, it's linking actual like velocity. However, it does do that by default, though you can tell it not to do that. Um, I wish I remembered how, although there is a way to do it. I just don't ever need to. It's not something I, I really pay attention to. For doing it for volume, is not really it doesn't really make a lot of sense. You can uh, you can do this for other parameters on the velocity mapping, so you can have velocity sensitivity for some other stuff. That's how you link velocity sensitivity to whatever that is. Mod X and mod Y link the controller the control to the two knobs up top. This is so that you can create macros of various parameters because just about every parameter has a mod X and mod Y uh, collection. Randomization is just randomization. And then unison index mapping is where you can set the value of the parameter per unison voice. Right now, there's no unison voices, but if I were to engage unison, suddenly there'd be a whole bunch of different poles here. And then each pole represents that one voice's value. So notice I have, I, I'm using this weird line type right here. Nothing in the middle of these two points does anything. It only matters which of these points are has a value. So it's probably a good idea to have snap on. Snap on, snap off, snap on, snapper. So this is me changing the, how loud each unison voice is. If you want to get that specific with your unison control. I tend not to. Although, it, for FM, you can do a lot of really fun stuff with that. So these are the basic controls with using um, just the, the regular oscillator. We have uh, da dampening. This is for plucked. This is how plucked does its job. And there's the phase control, which you can change per oscillator because we're doing this with the unison, unison in that map, map. We can still do kind of that. And then there's this tab, the oscillator tab. This is actually a little additive controller inside Citrus, which is a lot of fun. And the way this, this, this thing works is that when you have any shape of waveform, it doesn't have to be a sine wave. It can be anything else, like a saw wave. If I engage one of these oscillators, it puts in a higher version of that waveform. <laughs> Can be cool. If you zoom in, we can see pretty clearly that uh, this is representing harmonics. So we have the fundamental tone down here, the first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, all this stuff. And then you can see that um, each octave has double the amount of harmonics in between them as previous. So much so that the last octave of harmonics actually has half as many of the harmonics that are present uh, as the rest of them all combined. Now, Beyond just doing cool stuff with individual waveforms, the way that one thing that this is really really cool for is that you can actually resynthesize whatever waveform you've got into harmonics. So if I do like, sure, right click, convert shape to sine harmonics. Now we have the same shape, but it is now individually sine wave harmonics. Now, on top is the har uh, harmonic level, and the bottom is harmonic phase. So here's me moving around the bass, the actual bass fundamental tone. You can also come down to this drop-down menu, there's a bunch of options, including randomized phases, which is something I do a lot. Which is neat. B 
beyond um, what we were doing there with the resynthesis, one of the things that this is actually really good for is that if you drop a single cycle waveform into here, it'll resynthesize it in the oscillator panel, and then you'll have that waveform just built in, and it's a lot of fun. Notice how much things are fun? It's because everything's fun. Now, uh, beyond, this is all just stuff that you do on just operators for each individual thing, and then you can have six of them at once, so this is actually just a very extremely powerful subtractive synthesizer just in that regard. Now, the rest of this is how we use filters. <coughs> Sneezing. Ah, that's how you use filters, you sneeze. So these filters are down here, and they have parameters, and they're arranged in, this, in a very similar way to the operators. They have the filter type, which by default, it's this sort of uh, low band and high setup where you can fade between the low band and high. And then you have a very specific section just for the low band high for just this filter, because the rest of the filters are pretty regular, just like regular low pass, which low band high doesn't do anything for. But that's just what that's for. And now you notice how I'm moving it. Nothing's happening. How do we link a filter? Um, well, you gotta use the matrix. So this is, this is saying that I have to take operator one, link it to filter one, and then link filter one out, like that. Now, beyond that, uh, we have the same sort of configuration of parameters and modifiers. We have panning and volume for what we have going on. Cutoff is the cutoff filter over here. Resonance is the resonance value here. Low band high, like I said, is the control of the, the SVF filter which has the three different filters already engaged. Um, WS is the wave shaper. It has a wave shaper built in. You might have seen me use a wave shaper a lot and sort of post, and you can actually just use a wave shaper inside Stris. And it works basically the same way. It just has this weird, it has a not square interface. It just has a rectangular interface. However, the values are still the same. Uh, up here, we have uh, the amplitude and the mix. You can also change it between uh, unipolar and bipolar mode, and you can turn it on because it's not on by default. Start stuff. Over here we have uh, W mix, which is the mix value. So you can actually control the mix level, which is really pretty cool. And then we have this next button, this next knob. Uh, the way that it works is that you have uh, minus 100 and 100 percent. So this is you know phase and the other opposite phase. And then this leads it into the next filter. So if you want to have a filter in series, this is what you would do. So right now I have filter two on. It's filter two, filter two going out. And we can still hear audio because filter one has the next going into filter two. I can say filter two to go to next, and then we can do filter three out. And now we have filter one, two, and three in perfect serial uh, relationship. However, we can also do parallel at the same time. So we, now we have a combo, combo serial parallel, serial parallel, parallel. It sounds like a skateboarding move, a parallel. Anyway, um, then you can uh, you can blend between, you know how well how well it's going to mix the other two. You actually see that it's, you can see that like it doesn't know that it's on or off or it brought rather it does know if it's on or off uh, with filter two and three being like, is it on or off with the, how, how you actually mix the, uh, the next knob. So it knows where the signal's going into. So you have very fine control over what kind of serial or parallel control that you want. Um, that's a bunch of these stuff. And that's how you do filters. Filters also have the same, you know, envelope, LFO, keyboard mapping, mod X, mod Y, randomization, and also unison index mapping, which means you could map per unison voice a filter amount. So you can have a different filter amount for a whole bunch of unison voices, which is just a very, very cool concept. And we also have this effects tab. This is very basic built-in effects. And you can also actually also have a, a send output which is interesting if you want to have have it go post in that way. But you have a, you have a chorus built in, you have panning, uh, you have three different delays that you can come together, and also a reverb. Now, the way that the effects works is that there's no dry in the effects. The effects itself is purely uh, affected. And if you want to have dry, you also have to have the regular output. So that's how you, that's how you have effects mixed that way. The effects pretty much just has volume and panning together. Uh, not, not a lot of control on the rest of the parameters, but the rest of them are pretty just regular stuff. G 
chimes. So, we've talked about what the operators do. We've talked about what the filters do. There's also a panning knob here. It's really just panning, not a big surprise. Now let's look at the main window. So we have a global uh, filter and volume ADSR, if you want to mess with that. We have global pitch controls and LFL amounts, and also volume. I uh, have a built-in global EQ for very basic stuff. I tend not to mess with any of this whatsoever. If I want to, if I want to make, you know, changes to some things like pitch and LFL intensity, then I'll do that per operator. But if you wanted to have global control, that's how you do that. Same thing with uh, the units and stuff. Now, like by default, this has regular unison controls that you'd expect, you know, pitch, phase, and this is actually a sub introducing, which is kind of cool. And then um, an envelope variation control, all this stuff. It's regular unison business. Uh, this oscillator button will actually make it oscillator only, where it doesn't really involve panning. It's kind of the, the thing that they take away from that. It does something very specific, but as far as actual practical application, it's not super important. However, I, I don't really need to use any of these. I can just engage, I can engage voices, bring all of them back except for volume. And then I can, call, I can control pitch directly with the units index mapping. I can control phase directly with the units index mapping. I can even control volume directly with the units index mapping. So you have like literally unparalleled control over what your unison is doing inside, inside Citrus which is extremely impressive, and not something I learned until very recently. Over here, we have more controls as, as, as far as um, anti-aliasing goes. Anti-aliasing, if you remember from earlier, is, is the talk we gave about the Nyquist frequency and all that kind of stuff. Generally speaking, if you see these quality and or oversampling or resampling controls, that's what it's inferring, referring to. Um, I don't know if I talked about that yet in uh, FL's basics but if i haven't i will at some point because there's a lot of there's a bunch of global control about how that works inside fl um there's also a draft and a render option so draft means what it's doing when you're hearing it live and render means what it's doing when you're going to render it this is important because this will change the sound a bit when you make a sound and then you render it things like wave shaping and fm introduce a lot of extremely high frequencies if you're not band limiting and you're not controlling the aliasing live and you have this engaged then it will do a little bit of that when you render it and it could change the sound so if you want it to sound identical to what you're doing, just disable that and you don't have to worry about it. High quality envelopes uh, refers to um, the resolution of an envelope. So like you see this envelope, if we zoom in, we can see that it's doing a lot of really complicated stuff. And it's trying its hardest to do what I tell it to do. And this is pretty simple, but if I were to say do a sine wave based one, the math on where things are at any given time is not as high resolution as what the image perceives. And um, other pl plugins like Harmer can actually control this in a live way. And we can, you know, turn on here to make it high quality. But it uses a little bit more CPU to have high quality. And then it also does sort of change the sound based on how accurate the um, rep reproduction of what the image is showing you on render. So once again, if you want it to sound like what you're hearing right now, just have it off. And then it'll sound like that. We have the mod X and mod Y. Both of these things can be controlled and automated individually. A bunch of other options. The smoothing option is prime important, and this applies to the modulation. So if you're doing automation and you have smoothing on, it will, if you do really fast motion, it won't do it one-to-one -one with what you're doing. It'll delay a little bit so that it stays kind of smooth. So if you want sharp and fast automation, you need to disable smoothing. Enable randomness, you can turn that on and off. Uh, limit one voice per key is what the mono key does. Uh, we have soften attack of lower velocity voices. Uh, operator one pitch articulator equals global, which is to say that every operator will follow operator one's pitch articulation. So whatever it is that you do to the pitch up here will be the, what everyone else does. Um, we have the center, which is just global DC offset. Uh, Gibbs, this is um, a particular effect of FM that if you don't want to have, then you don't need it. And then portamento. <laughs> which I don't know how to control, but that's how you turn it on. And honestly, for things like uh, monophonic, portamento, and sliding and that kind of thing, I'd actually just use the uh, polyphony, polyphony settings inside the uh, settings window. I find that to be a much more direct and easy to deal with than... Um, Try to do that inside whatever Citrus can do. Other plugins do a little bit better job of allowing you to direct control over that kind of thing, like like Harmer. But for everything else, there's the channel settings window. 
Yeah. So um, I will have a, a other video just about talking about how FM is supposed to work with Citrus. Um, however, I will tell you one thing. Uh, the FM matrix is over here, and that makes a lot of sense, but there's also this RM button, which actually enables an entire other matrix f just for ring modulation. And I actually didn't even know that for a very long time. So just in case you didn't know that, I'm just letting you know so that if you want to mess around with it, you can just do that in the meantime. There's also some other, other stuff here, like, uh, yeah, here's the Yamaha DX7 preset. You can import this X, that kind of thing. There's a couple of copy and pasting oscillator settings, and there's various preset things like for chorus and reverb and unison, and there's uh, other options here for, oh, hey, there's Portamento. I wonder where that went. So there's that. And then here's where you disable velocity to volume so that you can um, control velocity yourself manually. Here's the uh, help button, which tells you what's up. 2003 was when, damn, man. Uh, there's also, here's a, a routing diagram for where, where everything's going, in case you were curious about that. You can't change it. It's just what it is. Uh, then we can get rid of the keyboard, if for some reason you wanted to do that. Yay. Yes, so this has been an overview of Citrus. Actually, that was a lot more in-depth than I, th I planned on going, but um, if you watch through all of that, then you've got an incredibly good sort of lead into using Citrus, even in, in, even in basic set, uh, like subtractive form, which is most of what we just discussed. We didn't touch anything about ring modulation or, or FM or any of that. Um, however, even without FM and RRM, Citrus is an extremely powerful and capable plugin just for... It's like the waveform morphing alone could be its own. Like if that could be its own thing, that would that itself be a very valuable, very powerful plugin. But you have the rest of this stuff and all kinds of control and routing and mapping and stuff. It's so good. Anyways, if you have any questions about this, please let me know. And as usual, have a nice day.